Hello, I'm Norma Ashby. My friendship with Blackfeet Chief Earl Old Person goes back nearly 40 years when I invited him, his dancers, singers, and drummers to come to KRTV in Great Falls to tape a 30-minute special on North American Indian Days in Browning, Montana. Here we are now at the 50th anniversary of North American Indian Days, as enthused as ever about this grand celebration. In this program, we want you to become better acquainted with this remarkable leader and to see why North American Indian Days continues to be one of the largest Indian powwows in Montana. Chief Old Person, as Master of Ceremonies for this celebration, could you please describe the dances and music presented by the hundreds of contestants who come here from throughout the nation and Canada? The round dance is uh, with the Blackfeet people. Uh, there was a time when it was just uh, the women performed. It was a ceremonial dance, the round dance. White feathers, stand by. Uh, today, it's it's uh, more of a social dance, and uh, many, if not all, the tribes performed around dance today. What about um, the fancy dance? This is a, a fancy dance is uh, one of the things that have come on uh, within the past few years, you know, well, recent years, and a lot of our young people get into the fancy dance, both uh, the boys, the men and women, and boys and girls, and it's more of a fast dance, so uh, a lot of our elders, you know, our older people do not take part, and, and it has a different uh, dress, you know, as uh, uh, that they perform in. All right, what about the jingle dance? The jingle dress the dance is really come from the east, uh, around the, uh, uh, I guess, the Wisconsin uh, with the Ojibwas at uh, Minnesota. That's where this jingle dress really come from. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, a lot of the people here within the western area really took to that. It's become very popular dance. Shawl dance? That's the fancy dance. The chicken dance? Well, that's, that's our dance, the old style chicken dance. Mm -hmm. That's how we dance, that's how I is dance. Is that a depiction of the grouse mating, or is that? Well, yeah, that's a dance I dance. Is uh, it? Uh, uh, the chicken dance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our people dance that. Okay. In fact, you didn't see the fancy bustles. Yes, I did. I think uh, they're awesome. Yeah, and that's not really, you know, the, the fancy dancers use those big fancy bustles. Okay. But the chicken dancers, they have a very small uh, bustle that okay. they use. Okay, and mm -hmm. is there a grass dance too? Is grass that still? dance is uh, another dance that's come very popular within the past few years. Okay. And you have a lot of were uh, fancy dancers start dancing the grass dance, and uh, and today a lot of the grass dancers that do the grass dance are doing the traditional dance. Mm -hmm. It's more for the uh, older dancers, uh, elderly dancers. And there are cash prizes. I mean, I'm sure some of these people that go from powwow to powwow can make pretty good money. Yeah, that's uh, that's come into uh, our dancing since we started the Indian days. And of course, I guess in the past years, uh, they might have had, but they never really did have a uh, contest but with our old traditional encampments. They really didn't have uh, come together to compete. It was just traditional dancing. But when this concept of Indian days started, you start seeing this competition right. dancing. Did you tell me that you were in the very first Indian days 50 years ago? Yeah. Dancing. I was dancing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with and, uh, with um, the chicken dance. Right, that, that was kind your, of a dance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. 
Could you have guessed it would have grown this much in 50 years? I didn't, I didn't think it was, for a while, I didn't think it was going to develop into the, what we have today. Uh -huh. Because when we first started having that back in 52, I guess it was, uh, they just, they didn't have an arbor like yeah. we have. Just, they just formed a circle. Now there's two other elements that we should just mention. One is the grand entry. We, I know you give a huge amount of respect to the flags. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very significant thing for you, is the respect for the American flag, the Canadian flag, the Blackfeet flag, mm -hmm. and the various flags of the military. Right. Um, this has always played a part, yes. has it not? I think we owe a lot to our veterans, people that have gone, served in the armed forces, and uh, just like our old warriors in the past. They went out and protected. They went to protect our land, protect the people. And uh, so I think whenever we have a chance to acknowledge them, we need to do it. And uh, this is where the flags comes in. They are always honored with the colors. The other element is the drumming, and you've got, you, you said you may have up to 30 drum groups coming Sometimes we may have up to 30. Now, it varies, but the most I think you can get, like with us, uh, there was one year we had to turn away some drums, you know, because we didn't have, we just didn't have the space. Let's talk about the songs that accompany the dances. Are any of them written down? Not too many songs have words, you know. There's certain songs that will have words, drummers will use with words. But it's more of a chant, it's just... Uh, more of a chant. Yes. And uh, each song is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the drummers, the singers, they compose their own songs, and they come up with new songs all the time. <laughs> Blackfeet Reservation of over one million acres is located on some of the most beautiful land in Montana. Not only is it situated on the rolling plains, but it is on the gateway to Glacier National Park. Here we see your tribe's herd of buffalo a few miles outside of Browning. How are they used by your people? There's a lot of our people uh, put on uh, ceremonies. They put on certain things, gatherings that they have, some religious gatherings. And they request for uh, a buffalo that they could use. And our people give them uh, uh, fish and wildlife people take care of. They eat the meat and they use it for their ceremony. Chief Old Person, you have been described by your friends and associates as humble, traditional, compassionate, respectful, knowledgeable, a still point in a turning world, and as a practitioner of the possible. How would you best describe yourself? Well, I guess uh, since I became a leader, even before I became a leader, I worked with uh, the elders. And from that time, I learned to uh, uh, follow after the things that I saw and uh, observed of these elders. Uh -huh. From that time, I guess uh, this is where my leadership started because I was uh, willing to uh, do what I could to help uh, uh, these elders with the things that uh, they were, they talked about, the things that they hoped for. And uh, the information that they had given me uh, of the past, the things that they, they saw and that they were doing of the present and and of course they were looking into the future for the benefit of their people. 
You have been a leader of your tribe for nearly 50 years when you were first elected to the Tribal Council in 1954. Economic development is a major concern as you strive for more jobs on the reservation. We've heard about the expansion of wind power here. What do you think are the prospects for its further development? Well, I think this uh, really uh, uh, urged us and encouraged us to get into this wind power because it's already been proven. We've, we had one that was put up by the Blackfeet Community College. Uh, and, uh, and just a few years ago, we have a few more east of Browning. And so that proved that we can have them and we can have them in a, in a, in, in a way where we can help others uh, while we're helping ourselves with it. And I think we have uh, that wind <laughs> here in Browning and on you're, the reservation. You're famous for the wind. Right. If you have a camper, don't drive through Browning on a right. windy day. Well, even a train, it yeah. blew a train over. <laughs> what about the future of oil and gas drilling on the reservation? Do you see do it, more of that happening? Oh, yes, we're trying to encourage the uh, oil companies to come, oil and gas people to come. You know, that's one of our main, uh, main resources uh, that we have and main things that we are using today. Yeah, that's been going on for a, a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, with oil being down, uh, it wasn't very good uh, for the past few years. Mm -hmm. But now since oil has come back up, uh, we're pursuing it again. What do you see as the role of the reservation in the future? Well, I think our people, I've said this, they're gonna they're going to be getting into more of this technical way of life today. Mm -hmm. And I think this is for our young people to come in. We need our young people to the point where they can be able to take part. Otherwise, if we don't help them out, if we don't seek for that help, they're going to be sitting on the sideline. Mm -hmm. Today, you, every office, I think, has a computer. Right. They have uh, fax machines. They, you have your phones today. You don't even have to go running into your offices, homes. You have them with you. Mm -hmm. It's all technology, and that's what the life is going to be about. But we're still going to have our reservations so long as we have uh, our tribal governments, uh, as long as we have the people. Uh, I think our reservations are going to go on. Because and we need to bring our people up to that, mm -hmm. where they can help our people within the reservations with that learning that they have. Of all the honors you have received, probably your greatest honor was given you in 1978 when you were named by the family of Chief Two Guns White Calf as the lifetime chief of the Blackfeet tribe. What has this honor meant to you? Well, that was uh, a, a surprise to me because I did not know this was going to take place until Again, it was during Indian days, North American Indian days. It was the last day when they asked me to uh, be part of an honoring ceremony that was going to take place. And of course, uh, they had the ceremony and the uh, family members of uh, our last uh, chief, uh, hereditary chief, were the people that uh, bestowed this honor on me. And, uh, and of course, you know, I, I was very uh, humble about it. I, I really didn't think that I was the person to receive this. But then I guess uh, that was one of the reasons they wanted to me, me to be uh, honored with this is because of how I took part in our way of life here on the reservation. You have a beautiful portrait of Chief Two Guns White Calf just above you. Um, tell us a little bit about him. Well, I always say that we had, we had different kinds of uh, leaders. Uh, we have the war leaders that uh, uh, back in those times that protect the people. They went out and seeked uh, for the survival. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course it came to the time when we start dealing with the governments that we're still dealing with today, I believe. White Calf, Chief Two Guns White Calf was one of those uh, people, individual, leader, a chief mm -hmm. that dealt in that way. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for many years. In fact, he uh, died in Washington, D.C. What are your ideas of better understanding between your culture and the white culture? Well, I think we need a lot of communication, such as we are doing here today. We need, lot, we need to relay messages uh, to one another in, in, a, in a rightful way and, and in a more meaningful way. I think one of the ways you do this is going around and speaking to school children. Right. And we have this wonderful poster in your office. Thank you, Chief Old Person, for coming to our class. We learn many things from you. And, and there's just a wonderful list of things they learn, like what fun it must be to be chief and yeah. what fun it must be to wear a headdress and so mm -hmm. on. But is that a wonderful step in the right direction? I think so. I think we need to get out to uh, our young people. Uh, I think they're looking toward us there. Uh, I guess I might say they're reaching out to us and we need to respond to them however we could help them out. Do you think enough is being done today to preserve the culture of your people? I don't, I, I can't say there's enough. I think there's always uh, more can be done. And, but I am, I am uh, uh, thankful to the people that are doing what they can to help our young people in yeah. maintaining and preserving. There is a school, as I understand, here in Browning that's just teaching the Blackfeet language, yes, is that correct? Yes, it's called a Cutwood School, okay. and it's all Blackfeet. It's, uh -huh. uh, they, they have, just like any other school, graduation, you know, uh, when they feel that these children are ready to go out there and, you know, mm -hmm. speak the language and, and show that uh, they are doing it. It's, uh, it, it's it's a good thing to see. You have met all the U.S. presidents since Harry S. Truman. Here in your office at Blackfeet Tribal Headquarters, we see pictures of you with Presidents Bush, Clinton, Ford, and Reagan. Of all the presidents you have met, who do you think has done the most for Indian people? Well, I guess we, we had John F. Kennedy that uh, really set out some things for uh, Indian people to, to use and to do. Uh, I guess this is, this is where Head Start came in. We had uh, the elderly programs. I always say that they were pretty much forgotten for a while, but they were brought into the picture. And uh, I think that's one of some of the things that I, I saw that uh, during that administration they went on into other uh, leaders. The other uh, president would be Nixon. He signed a lot of Indian uh, claims for the Indian people, uh, a lot of Indian uh, bills uh, during his time. And, and uh, I served on some of his task force uh, for one, self-determination. Uh, I was one of the task force members. I'd like you also to mention that he sent you as his ambassador to the 2500th anniversary of Iran. Right. And it was there that you got to meet the Shah. I was invited by the Shah through the president, uh, uh, Nixon. And uh, I went on over and of course Tehran, the city of Tehran was uh, very much decorated. The day that I was to leave, I was going into Jerusalem. I received a message at the hotel from the Shaw mm -hmm. and uh, asked me to come over and uh, have what he called high tea. So uh, I went on over there. And there was about maybe 200 in numbers that were invited. I was asked to give a talk so I got up, I stood up to give my talk. And when I got up standing, I asked the Shaw to stand with me. So he got up. And of course, when he got up, everybody got up you know, standing. And uh, while I was talking to the Shaw, I mean, while I was giving the talk, I could see some of the people around smiling, you know, kind of laughing. And I thought, well, my, I must be doing something wrong, you know. So I cut my talk short. And uh, anyway, he responded to my talk. Uh, he's, 
gave a response to it. And in the meantime, I asked the interpreter, I says, uh, did I do something? I see the people kind of smiling. Did I do anything wrong? He said, no, 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 there's nothing wrong. He says, the one thing you've done, he says, there's no one has ever asked a Shaw to stand. You're the first one. <laughs> I was going to ask you the role that your wife Doris has played in your long marriage well, towards your successful career. I, th I think uh, Doris has uh, very much knowledgeable about many things of our Indian way of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, uh, she's taken a leadership uh, role in many ways uh, in different areas, mainly in the education. Mm -hmm. She's been a teacher. She was a teacher up until, I think, she retired after 36 years, and of course she's still working with the system today. Uh, but she's helped me a great deal. She, uh, she's backed me up. I know there's times that uh, it was hard, but uh, she stood by me and she uh, continued yeah. helping me however she could. Would you like to show your headdress at this time? And cause, because there again we see a beautiful collection of eagle feathers and as I understand, this is a gift that was given to you. Um, well, they have uh, what they call Kana chieftains in Canada. That's been on way back in 1800. And they select 40 members. All the time, there's, there's got to be 40 members. As one passes away or dies, you know, deceased, they'll replace, or if there's two people. This year, they're going to replace four. And uh, I usually go over there uh, during their, when they're going to have the induction ceremonies to be part of it. This was transferred to me when I was inducted to the Indian chieftain, uh, to the Kana chieftain. And uh, yes, it's eagle feathers and the plumes and the ermine skins horse here. And you'll be wearing that uh, in the celebration here? The North yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll be wearing it. And, I worry a lot, you know, there's, uh, we have many ceremonies that take place that we're called to be part of. Would you just put it on for a second? Sure. You know, so we can just show how, how very impressive it is when you're wearing it. And the ermine tails that come down from the side. Is there any significance for the number of eagle feathers that are around? Not, not really, not but really. there's usually around 30. Let's talk about your athletes on the reservation and how they have excelled this year, beginning with Mike Chavez, who was named Most Valuable Player for the second year in a row as his basketball team from Hart Butte won the Class C Championship. I think he's uh, among the best. Yeah, he's about 6'7", uh, right. uh, Most Valuable Player in Class mm -hmm. C for two years. And he's just a young player, you yeah. know. He'll be a uh, senior next year, yeah. honey. And uh, he's done an outstanding job. Yeah. He's uh, uh, done great for Hart Butte. Yeah. And of course, Hart Butte themselves, were, uh, they have a lot of fine ball players. Right. And then as far as Browning, you had the Class A championship team this year. This reservation must have gone wild with both, both C and A well, champions. Well, yeah, that was something that uh, <laughs> come to the reservation, you know, <laughs> and winning both uh, titles. Right. And then our boys in the cross country won the state yeah. eight title. Uh, they, uh, it was outstanding. And I want to ask you, what has given you the greatest satisfaction of being born as an Indian? I think one of the things that, uh, that I, I'm glad for being both, I can, we have two cultures. My native way of life, and then way of life. And I can be part of the modern way of life, today's society. And that's, that's a great thing to be part of. I can refer back to my people, and I can refer to the things and to the people today that I work with. And, and I think it's, it, it's something that uh, not too many have, and I'm glad to be part of it. Chief Old Person, what is the legacy you would like to leave for those young Indian leaders coming after you? I think some of the things that our young people need to understand is the respect of our people, the respect for people. 
And I think that if they can begin to realize that we come from people that were very sincere about their way of life, and for us to continue being here and for being part of and to continue holding on to that what we have. Today we have a life that is very complicated. Sometimes I say life is not real anymore. Uh, and so a lot of our elders today, they'll refer back to those old days as the happy times, although they had a very harsh life. Chief Old Person, as you look back and as you look forward, where do you think we need to go as a society in dealing with our Indian population in America? I think we need more communication, uh, that's for sure. We need to have that better understanding of who we are, what we are. And I think we need to contact one another uh, however we can. Uh, just like our Indian, celebra Indian Day celebration, we invite everybody, regardless of who. We want them to be part of us, to see what we have. Perhaps talk to people. You know, we have a lot of good people and uh, interesting people. A lot of people who can give you information about who we are and what we're doing. I want to personally thank Chief Earl Old Person for inducting me into the Blackfeet tribe 20 years ago and giving me the name Princess Thunder Woman. From the 50th anniversary of North American Indian Days in Browning, Montana, this is Norma Ashby, Princess Thunder Woman, reporting. <laughs>